So this is basically a story about sustainability and how consciousness is cyclical and that's even with your dietary habits like just for the record I used to be a vegan and vegetarian I've been a raw tarian I've been a breath tarian yeah try living off just water and air meditating yeah <laughs> You get a real conscious connection with your cells, let me tell you. But so now I'm a desertarian and I'm a sustainable being and I'm usually a hunter gatherer in my DNA or I'm a farmer and I can stomach killing things now. Like if you can't stomach it, you shouldn't stomach it. And I would be capable of doing it compassionately if I had to. I don't have to because I have chickens and hopefully they'll start laying eggs. But um yeah, so I have all this amazing land. I don't have a garden yet. Like, I'm waiting for all the windows to manifest for my um, greenhouse because I'm a sustainable person. I'm not going to just go buy it. And uh, the universe will provide it, you know, abundance. But, like, I got cedar planks coming for I just a fence that just got torn down for my for my um, garden. But So this all started because there's a dog here, a puppy, whose name is Boone, and he is... A carnivore and everyone's a vegan and I don't think they ever give him bones and stuff so he chews on cans and he chews on like plastic and stuff and that's what are, what's around and um, dogs need that because they need to relieve that tension and that pressure in their jaw and then they need to um, tear flesh and bite down on bones because it removes tartar and all that stuff and so I was like well I need to get I need to get some kind of bone and Two bones are a bit expensive for me, so I got some soup bones, and it works perfect with my lifestyle and like how I do my shopping because I do not like to think when I go in a grocery store and I get overwhelmed. I like go in and I'm like, oh, it's packaging, it's one big mountain of garbage about to be happening, and like I just I don't know, like there's too many decisions and I don't want to think about it. And so thank God for the Piggly Wiggly, the gross misery store down the way. They have a, a discount bin, and it helps me practice my waste not want not principle. And it's like the thrill of the hunt, you know? I like go in there and I'm like, yes, I got it. Like I got a good deal. And so I got that soup bone and it's cold, so it's perfect. Look at, I got amazing soup going. So I got all these onions, two bags for like less than $2. And then two big bundles of like broccoli and carrots and like big bag of carrots, big Mondo like carrots on steroids but from a local farmer, and they were only like a dollar. And then I, you know, I got like all these bananas, I just freeze them for smoothies. All that tofu, literally a dollar sixty for all of them. A dollar a piece for that hummus. I mean, it makes my life a lot easier. I just go in and I'm like, mm, there it is. Like, there it is, that's what I'm gonna be eating tonight. Um, And I normally get fruit for my kefir. Cause it's gonna, it's about to be going bad. So it's like it's high point of sugar. So it's perfect for my kefir babies, and I and they didn't have any. And um, it's kind of funny. This like sweet older like black lady comes up to me and she goes, "Baby, if you don't mind me asking, how old are you?" And I was like, "How old do you think I am?" And she's like, 16. And I was like, "Bless your heart." I was like, "Winning!" Like literally, I think um, it must have been the juice because she's like, she's like. I just saw this, like, what I thought was a little person just shopping. I'm just giggling over here in the corner. And I was like, was it the juice? Because <laughs> I got, like, eight, nine, ten things of juice in my cart. Because if I don't have fruit, I got to still flavor my kefir water. And so, yeah. But, yeah, that's my story. But, I mean, everybody out there who's a vegan and vegetarian, it's like, that could change. And if you're not open to that change, then you're not open to the lessons that the universe is still trying to teach you. Like right now, it's more cost effective for me to be a meat eater. I can get an organic steak, big giant grass fed organic steak from a local farmer and support my local community, which I highly believe in, at the co-op for $5. And I can cut it in three and I can literally eat that for three days for five dollars and I can't do that. I can't get all my amino acids to synthesize my own protein to have a healthy brain function so I don't suffer depression and I don't get like, you know, like, uh, you know, my muscle starts to eat itself because it's not, I'm not gaining any muscle. If I don't eat nuts and berries and everything I need, I need 11 amino acids to complete the, the I think it's 20, uh, we make nine. And so you got to accumulate, eat, not 11. I can't afford that. 
I mean, seriously, almonds and everything are highly expensive. Quinoa, I don't really like harming the Peruvians. Like, we're totally screwing up their local economy with our quinoa consumption, and I believe in waste not want none anyways. And so, I, but a lot of times there's discount meats and stuff, and it's like they're gonna throw it away anyways. Might as well eat it. It's a lot cheaper. Um, avocados here, I think, are a dollar fifty. One avocado, a dollar fifty. I don't have them grown yet. Now, if I had them grown, it'd be a different story. But I don't know. I'm not even working, so yeah. My job is basically to get the healing center ready for summer, so then it could be a self-sufficient unit. So yeah, I don't know. Just be open to change, and don't beat yourself up if stuff has to change in your daily eating habits. Because, like I said, I've been a vegan, I've been a vegetarian, I've been a rawitarian, I've been a breathitarian, I've been, and now I'm a desertarian. Now I'm just... Survivalism. <laughs> I mean, isn't that what it really all is, is about? And animals... <sighs> life feeds on life. It's not right to kill an animal not compassionately. Like, if I'm sitting here and I'm beating it, and I'm, like, making it suffer... I think that's why the Native Americans, when they hunted, they taught their young, young, because you had to be an effective hunter. You had to know how to kill that thing quickly and compassionately. It doesn't suffer. And they didn't want to have to track it. Like, they only wanted to track it to find it. Like, not, oh, I missed and I only nicked it. Let me hunt it down. And meanwhile, that animal's suffering and stressing itself out and tainting the meat. And now uh, you're going to eat not that great stuff. And so that's why, like, animal abuse is totally freaking wrong. And that's why we need to localize it. Because the local farmer is a lot less likely to beat the crap out of its animals because they love them. And someone who's just going in for $8 an hour, and a lot of times, you know what, I think people turn into psychopaths and sociopaths in the meat in the slaughterhouses because it's got to be a really hard thing every day of your life to kill something. And so they're, like, self-preserving and detaching themselves. And still it's not right. Like, there are ways that we can hurt animals and kill animals compassionately. And it's like, people who say killing isn't right, you know what? Just by breathing, you're killing. And I guarantee you, on a daily basis, you kill animals. For something that you don't even need. Something you want. Like, I don't know, coffee, sugar, um, beer. Anything that's agricultural related. We had to kill the rainforest for space for that, thus killing all the animals in it. So once again, localize it, because this land is already cleared. Wow, imagine that. We're not having to kill anything anymore. So compassion has many forms. Much love, all.